Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist. On this channel, I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants. And in today's video, we're gonna be talking about fish emulsion. And this is going to be a full look at fish emulsion. We're not just gonna talk about what it is and what's in it, but we're actually going to be looking at some studies that were done both on the soil itself, but then the plant biomass, both above ground and below ground and analyzing what's happening and if it's beneficial. Then we'll be talking about the elephant in the room, which is mercury in fish emulsion and whether or not it ends up into our plant biomass that we eat and if this can be harmful to us humans. And then lastly, we are going to go through my wonderful time making fish emulsion. It is not for the faint of heart, but I did learn some things along the way that you should consider if you want to make your own fish emulsion because these are steps you most definitely do not want to skip, especially if you have a weak stomach. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. So I did do an article way back on fish emulsion on the website gardeningincanada.net and this will not be the same as that article. The article is going to touch on some ideas that we touch on here, but if you want a full scope on fish emulsion or you want to learn more before consider using it, then for sure check out that article. I'll leave the link for it down in the comment section and the description, but in that I also have some links to fish emulsion products that I agree with or that I believe would work in some of them I've actually used myself as well. Fish emulsion is the same as fish fertilizer so these two terms can be used interchangeably when talking about fish fertilizer or fish emulsion in general. The difference in products isn't in the name it's actually in the concentration of NP and K. So the classic NPK values for fish emulsion are 5-1-1 but depending on how much water or how dehydrated the product is, these levels may go up or down. So just keep that in mind. One thing that people don't talk about when it comes to fish emulsion is that there is actually very high levels of calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. And anyone who farms knows that when you grow canola, for example, you typically will buy a fertilizer mix with four digits. And we don't see that very often here in gardening. Hopefully that changes one day. But the fourth digit in the whole lineup, it's N, P, K, and S. And any chemistry nerds out there know that stands for sulfur. And sulfur is very, very important, especially when we're talking about growing brassica species. So things like cabbage, broccoli, uh, Brussels sprouts, mustard, that sort of thing. But they're actually, it's actually important to a lot of crops out there. And it's often overlooked when we're looking at it from a gardening perspective. However, fish emulsion does supply this and it supplies it actually in a relatively high number, especially when compared to other organic fertilizers. Now, Fish fertilizer or fish emulsion is OMRI approved. In the scale or the uh, perspective or, of organic products, I like to think of OMRI certifications or organic certification in any capacity as a scale. So there's a big scale of what's organic and what's not. There is literal uh, rock phosphate that's been big rock made into little rock that's then scattered on top of the soil. That would be, you know, or as organic as you could possibly get. Very little manufacturing done to it, very little processing done. Fish emulsion does have some, some uh, things done to it, but um, with that being said, it's within the perspective, the chemicals added are within uh, the tolerance of organic. So is it a true, you know, back to the, roots organic product no unfortunately it is not but it does get omri certification it does classify as organic which i mean like i said it's a it's a sliding scale we got humic acid for example that can be made from coal so it's a sliding scale when it comes to actually determining whether or not something is considered organic. So keep that in mind. So let's look at these studies that have been done on fish emulsion itself. The first one that looks at the soil showed an increase in EC and an increase in pH. Now EC refers to electrical conductivity, which 
also is a very fancy way of referring to our CEC, which is our cation exchange capacity. So EC is a way of measuring how much negative charge is in the soil itself. The higher the negative charge, the more likely the soil is able to act like a battery. The reason being is because a majority of plant nutrients, once bioavailable to the plant, is a positive charge, meaning in order for it to be stored in the system, we need a negatively charged soil. Hence why EC increasing is a good thing. So as this increases, it can help with the holding power of the soil. Now, when we add fish emulsion to increase our EC, there are some limitations. For example, if we have a clay soil, fish emulsion isn't going to do a big number in increasing it because clay already has such a high EC, fish emulsion probably isn't going to make a huge difference. However, it can help with tilth and actual soil aggregation. So with that being said, it can help with soil structure and increasing the macro porosity within the soil system of a clay system, which is a good thing for plant roots. Now on the other side of the spectrum is sand and in sand, an increase in EC is a very, very good thing. This is something we desperately need when we're dealing with a sandy soil. However, fish emulsion added to a sandy soil with no other reclamation done to it isn't going to work entirely because the fish emulsion is just going to simply water its way through the sand profile and then as more water is applied, rain, whatever the case is, just gonna continue to drive it down until it hits the water table or until it hits a clay seam or it runs off. So with a sandy soil, we do still have to follow the sandy soil video that we did and do some reclamation to the sandy soil to try to bring it closer to a loamy soil. Which brings me to a loamy soil. If we add a fish emulsion to a loamy soil, our cation exchange capacity, our EC, isn't you know miraculous in a loam soil. It's not as crazy as a clay soil, but it's not as poor as a sandy soil. However, there's huge benefits to using a fish emulsion to help increase the EC. So if you have a loam soil, whether it be a sandy loam, a clay loam, or anything in between, this may be a perfect recipe for you to use. I think I've talked about this so many times on so many different videos, but actual bioavailable nutrients to the plant can't be released unless it's within a certain pH range. Now, for some of us, this is a non-factor, and especially when we're talking about the outdoors, raised bed gardening in large soil platforms, changing the pH of a system that big is nearly impossible. You kind of are at the sacrifice of the parent material of that actual soil. However, in a container garden or in an indoor plant environment where we're using peat moss, coconut choir, whatever the case is, we can benefit from a product that is able to change the pH because it is a closed system, meaning we can do some damage or we can change this to our benefit and help make those plants nutrients more bioavailable based on the pH. So what fish emulsion does is it increases the pH. And this is a good thing because if we're using a peat moss or a coconut choir based potting soil, as time goes on, it degrades and it becomes more and more acidic. So when we add a fish emulsion to it, it can help reclaim that peat moss to a point and help bring that pH back into a proper prospect for the actual plant itself. So using fish emulsion as a way to naturally change your soil pH is thumbs up and definitely approved. It is very natural and it's not as harsh as some of the, some of the actual pH balancer products. With any organic fertilizer that isn't completely refined into a granular format and is still in the case uh, of a manure or compost or a fish emulsion, we always talk about the addition of proteins, oils, and carbohydrates. And while these mean absolutely nothing to a plant because the molecules are much too large for a plant to do anything with, they do mean something to the actual biomass um, and live biomass of the soil. So the living portion of our soil, which means our decomposers. And when we give them food to eat, then they will eat it, they will multiply, and they will expand in the soil, which is always a good thing. So when we add a fish emulsion, we are adding food, not only for the plant, but also for the decomposers and other animals, mini animals living inside the soil, which can help with 
not only nutrient cycling, but also the actual protection from fungi, bacteria, viruses, or pests in the soil that can actually harm our plants. So this is incredibly beneficial both in an outdoor setting and an indoor setting as well. So mercury, <laughs> this is uh, definitely an issue with fish emulsion and there's really no way to get around it. And so there isn't necessarily a potential for over application of fish emulsion because it is organic. It's very, very difficult to over apply. However, there is a slight concern of a phytoremediation happening that we do not intend for. So when we look at plants in a reclamation area, for example, people or environmental scientists, environmental soil scientists will use plants to help phytoreclaim an area, meaning these are hyper accumulators and they are designed, I guess in a way, to help accumulate toxins from the soil and put them into the biomass of the plant. Now, these aren't GMO, these aren't Franken foods at all, they're actually the foods we eat all the time. And the reason for this special design is because the evolutionary, on the scale of evolution, they want to survive. And so if they can make their upper biomass toxic in to other animals or insects through phytoaccumulation of very harmful products or chemicals, then what ends up happening is we end up with, you know, the plant ends up surviving because the deer learn that when we eat said plant, we end up getting sick because there's high levels of, you know, whatever chemical. So mercury is one of those products that uh, plants like to take up and they use it as a defense mechanism for being eaten, which obviously helps them survive. So with that being said, the plants to take into consideration, um, not saying you can't use fish emulsion with these plants, you can use fish emulsion with these plants. The issue is that if we are consuming these plants is that we don't want to overdo it and we may consider to use a different form a fertilizer that is lower in mercury. So I'm just gonna read off a list here for you of plants to be aware of when using fish emulsion. The first one is lettuce, second is amaranth, the third is water spinach, tomatoes, peppers, and cucumbers. So these are all considered accumulators, not necessarily hyper accumulators. So lettuce, amaranth, and water spinach are very good at capturing mercury. The tomatoes, peppers, and cucumbers are pretty good at catching mercury, but not as good as the first three. So plants to keep in mind when using a fish emulsion with, again, um, this is a pretty well understood process that plants are able to do this. So I don't take it lightly when I say use caution. Definitely use caution. I mean, you can use the fish emulsion with this. Just keep in mind that there are alternatives you may want to use and it's probably a good idea to use them. And yeah. Now let's get to the fun part where I actually made my own fish emulsion. So if you guys don't follow me on Instagram, you don't know this, or Facebook or the Facebook group, um, I am, a f I love fishing and it, it's just, I don't have to catch anything, I just enjoy being outdoors. And so we catch fish all summer, all winter, we ice fish. It's a very Canadian thing to do, I know. But anyways, we fish and we always bring home fish to fill it. And so we end up with bits and bobs of fish that necessarily isn't meat. So we, I had the brilliant idea to make my own fish emulsion this summer and it is not for the faint of heart. I'm not going to lie. It is a very stinky process and it takes anywhere from one to three months to actually process, depending on how much bacteria you have actively going on in the whole container. So what you want to do is you want to add water, molasses and sugar, and then you're going to put your fish inside. I made the mistake of not getting a sealed top, which I highly recommend you get, and then allowing it to air off. Now, 
I don't know how safe this is. I'm not going to lie. We, I put an aerator in there to keep it aerobic, but I just get the sense that this could be kind of toxic um, from a bacteria side, fungal side. So I'm not sure I'd do it again. It also really, really, really stunk, like to the point where I'm confident my neighbors could smell it. So we ended up just throwing the whole thing out because we brought it to the farm and just like threw it uh, as coyote bait. And I think the reason uh, why it stunk so bad is maybe I didn't have enough aeration, but it's definitely something you can try. I just seriously recommend caution. It is pretty nasty stuff to go through, which is why you should just buy some instead my personal opinion any users i want to thank you guys so much for watching if you enjoyed this video be sure to give it a thumbs up let me know in the comments down below if you've made your own fish emulsion or if you've used it and found fantastic results i will talk to you guys next time bye